most directors had no idea what uh, a girl would wear in a picture. The dress designer would come down on the set with a lot of designs. The director would look at them, okay them, and that was all. He, he was not connected in any way, really, with the picture, except in the direction. The same about the sets. Pabst himself some days would go around if he, if he wanted shadows. For instance, going up into the attic in London where they live. And Pabst himself was supervised the spraying of the, of the uh, what to make it smoky. And everything was integrated with him. So we got back to the suit and I said, well, that's my favorite suit and it's damned expensive. And he said, oh, no, no, that's all right. He said, so we took it away and the morning came to shoot the scene and Josephine disappeared and came back with my suit. This is your own suit, right? Yes. I mean, not something... He often, no, he yes. often used my clothes. Half the clothes would be mine because he changed the scene and uh, he'd say, bring me a dressing gown, bring me an evening or so on. So she came back with my costume and I looked at it and said, my God, the skirt had been torn and ripped and dipped in oil. The, the lovely blouse was a mess. The coat he threw away, I only wore the blouse and I began to weep. I said, that's my suit. Oh, it's, it's the way he did things that was so amusing. Because anyone else would have gotten some ragtag, bought something, yeah. dirty dirt. But he wanted something that was mine and I loved so that I would feel terrible in it. And I did. Here I was in my beautiful suit and it was ruined. So it made me feel like this. And that's how I was at the end uh, of the picture. Mr. Papp's perfect costume sense symbolized Lulu's character and her destruction. It is in the worn and filthy garments of the streetwalker that she feels passion for the first time, comes to life so that she may die. When she picks up Jack the Ripper on the foggy London street and he tells her he has no money to pay her, she says, never mind, I like you. It is Christmas Eve, and she is about to receive the gift that has been her dream since childhood. Death by a sexual maniac. And this compounded with the fact that the man who played Jack the Ripper was someone that you found enormously attractive. Yes, so. Pabst was very clever about uh, knowing whom I found attractive. The moment uh, Diesel came on the set for something or other, I don't think he'd given him the part yet. And he saw that we just adored each other. And I think that was the happiest scene of the whole picture. And this was very intimate there. It was only Diesel and I and the cameraman. And we had a lovely time between each scene. Here he is with a knife, which he's going to stick up into my interior, thrown on the table, and we'd be singing. And you would never know. You'd think we were, uh, it was really a Christmas party. Despite some lavish promotion, Pandora's box was a failure with the public. Louise Brooks cannot act, wrote one critic. She does not suffer, she does nothing. There was outrage, too, at the disservice done to a German classic. Hurrying through a hostile crowd at the premiere in Berlin, Brooks heard moviegoers shout, there's the American girl who is playing our German Lulu. But Pabst had other plans for his protege. Through the French company so far, he began to set up a film provisionally called Miss Europe. When she arrived in Paris, Brooks found that her reputation for beauty preceded her. Shop windows featured displays of her photographs, but as yet there was no finance to shoot the film. All Brooks could do was pose for the photo sessions and await developments. 
So there I was holed up in the Royal Monceau with nothing to do. I didn't know anybody. And all of a sudden, a uh, uh, Pabst appeared. He was on his way to London. And he asked me out, and this is a rather strange happening. He asked me out, and I went out with him and Dr. Pinez and somebody else, and uh, they said, where do you want to go? And I said, Chez Florence. It was a place with a colored band. And I went there every night. So we went there, and we sat down, and Pabst was displeased with me. I was drinking. His idea of a drink for me was a fruit salad in a, a pitcher surrounded by a little bit of champagne. Uh, and a Kaiser cup and such things, but I was drinking a brandy or something. And over across the way, I saw Townsend Barton. He was one of the aristocrats of New York who'd gone into movies and wrote the script, incidentally, of uh, Love Him and Leave Him. But he quit then. He didn't care. He was rich. And there he's sitting with this great English lady, the Honorable Mrs. Daisy Fellows, where she had a yacht, and, and Townsend, of course, loved money, like all rich people. And I told the waiter to tell Mr. Martin to come to my table. He didn't come, and Mr. Pabst, in the usual German fashion, had given me a bouquet of roses, a cluster of roses. Well, finally, Townsend came over, and he was a tall, blonde man, and he bent over my table. He said, I'm terribly sorry, Louise. He said, I couldn't leave Daisy alone, whereupon I took this bouquet and sliced him across the face, leaving trickles from the uh, uh, thorns. Oh, blood? Blood, of course. Oh, marvelous. And he, he was a gentleman, and, and he laughed. But Mr. Pabst, I thought he was going to kill me right there. And all the men sitting at the table from so far. And uh, Pabst said, uh, oh, I'm terribly sorry. He knew Townsend. Townsend, Townsend, that's all right, all right. He said, so Mr. Pabst grabbed me and took me back to the Royal Monceau. So what do I do? I'm in a terrific mood, so I decide to banish his disgust by giving the best sexual performance of my career. I jump into the hay and deliver myself to him, body and soul. He acted as if he'd never experienced such a thing in his life. You know how men want to pin medals on themselves when they excite you. They get positively radiant. Next morning, Mr. Paps was so pleased he couldn't see straight. Hoping that the affair might continue, Paps hastily set up a new project, Diary of a Lost Girl, from a novel by Margareta Burma. But by the time he could arrange for Brooks to come to Berlin to begin filming, she had a new lover. This time I had in tow the Eskimo. But they called him the Eskimo because his hair was perfectly blonde, so that it looked like a, a white fur cat. He was living on a small allowance when I met him at a party. And he said, and who is this? I, I said, the Eskimo. I, the Baron Beak, I said, he was family. He was really a Baron, but that didn't impress Pabst. So all the time we made a diary, I had uh, Esky in tow. Diary of a Lost Girl records the downfall of a virginal girl at the hands of a callous seducer. Pabst assembled a powerful cast from his repertory of actors to fill out this pallid fable. Fritz Rasp, as you know, plays the uh, chem uh, chemist assistant who seduces me first. And came the time when we were to do the scene where he has made me promise that I will get out of bed at 11 at night and come down and meet him in the uh, pharmacy. So he perhaps went through a lot of nightgowns and he'd feel them and finally he picked out a nightgown. And now he said, you've got a lot of Japanese robes at home, silk or short ones like this, but soft jet. Now he said, let's go and look in your trunk. So we went and we looked through my trunk and he picked out a soft blue and white and he said, that's it. And the scene begins where we talk, and then Rasp holds me, and then we turn, and he was a very big man, which helped. And I liked him very much, of course. And then I faint and fall down, and just in one marvelously graceful swoop, he picks me up just like a beautiful piece of silk.
and that's all, really. Sex is so different now, isn't it? But you got more sex out of that scene, just the way he picked me up and moved right out through the curtains. So this was all a scene of touch, almost no words. Just, it was really a, a ballet. It was during the making of Diary of a Lost Girl, on the last day of shooting, to be exact, that Mr. Paps moved into my future. We were sitting gloomily at a table watching the workmen while they dug a grave for the burial scene when he decided to let me have it. Some weeks before, he had met the friends, the rich Americans with whom I spent every hour away from work, and he was angry. First, because he thought they prevented me from staying in Germany, learning the language and becoming a serious actress as he wanted and last because he looked upon them as spoiled children who would amuse themselves with me for a time and then discard me like an old toy. Your life is exactly like Lulu's, he said, and you will end the same way. I just sat sullenly glaring at him, trying not to listen. Fifteen years later in Hollywood, with all his predictions closing in on me, I would hear his words again hissing back at me. The Canary murder case had been Brooke's last Hollywood silent film before her departure to Germany. At the time, she had refused to cooperate on its conversion to sound, but when she returned to Hollywood, she found that the studio had got around the problem without her. Miss Odell, may I see you for a few moments, please? It won't get you anything, but come ahead. Thank you. Paramount had managed the conversion with considerable expense and difficulty, well, using a dubbed voice and, for some shots, a Louise Brooks look-alike. How much? Nothing doing, Mr. Spotswood. I've decided to marry Jimmy. I'm afraid that marriage is quite out of the question, Miss Odell. Oh, you're sure about that, are you? I'm positive. Well, how would you like me to tell the world about Jimmy's embezzling from your bank? What? You heard me. You know, Jimmy has a weakness for writing letters. And I have a weakness for using them. If Jimmy did write you a letter, you'll tear it up. Now, before I leave here. Sure. Go ahead, tear it up yourself. My memory's still perfect. Oh, yes, yes, I see. Yes. Very well. You win. When I went back to Hollywood in 1930, I knew I was going to take it on the chin because I was pretty elegant, pretty grand. I was slumming. In Hollywood, these illiterate people. <laughs> so when I went back broke in 1930, uh, oh, I had a job with Harry Cohen. And I wouldn't go to work for him. He'd make me come to his office. It was really entirely her own fault, and she herself admits that, that she came back from Europe, where she'd achieved this kind of prestige by working with Pabst and Janina and Rennie Claire. And she came back and felt that the films she'd been doing in Hollywood were basically just junk, which they were, really weren't. I mean, that's the way she felt about them. And she wanted to do the prestige films, the big films in Hollywood. That was just the wrong time for it, that transition to sound. Uh, they weren't making that kind of film. They were just trying to keep their heads above water. They were concentrating on uh, talk for its own sake. And it was exactly the wrong time to be temperamental, and that's what she seemed to be doing. And she gave Paramount a very hard time, and in return, they gave her a hard time and literally sabotaged her career.